February, the last LC-130. Hercules lifts off the ice runway at McMurdo Station. Engines fading into the polar wind. For the crew remaining behind, 50 scientists, engineers, and support staff. That departure marks the beginning of an eight-month period with no connection to the outside world. No resupply flights, no emergency evacuations, no fresh food arriving by ship or plane. The sea freezes solid, the sun sets and won't rise again for four months. Temperatures drop to 60 below zero Celsius at the coast, 73 below at the South Pole. And every calorie the crew will consume until October was ordered over a year ago, packed into containers and shipped to Antarctica last summer. This is the reality of Antarctic food systems, a carefully engineered balance of industrial freezers, hydroponic gardens, and kitchen rituals designed to sustain both body and mind through the longest night on the planet. The winter over begins the moment that the last aircraft departs. It's not a gradual transition. One day, resupply is possible. The next day, it's not. The window closes fast. By late February, the sea ice surrounding coastal stations had thickened enough to trap any vessel attempting to reach them. Further inland, stations like Amundsen-Scott at the South Pole become unreachable by a different calculus. Polar night and catabatic windstorms ground aircraft for months. Weather conditions don't just discourage travel, they make it physically impossible. The isolation is absolute in a way few environments enforce. A submarine crew can surface, a space station can abort. Antarctic winter overs have no abort option. The crew committed to staying knew this months before departure, but the reality sharpens when that plane disappears over the horizon. 50 people, 50,000 kilograms of food, 270 days until the first resupply. The math was done over a year ago when the order was placed. How much flour, how many kilograms of frozen chicken, how many cans of tomatoes. Decisions made by a logistics officer and a chef who had to predict not just caloric needs, but morale needs for a crew they might never meet. Enduring conditions they can only imagine. One miscalculation has no remedy. There is no midwinter supply run. There is no grocery delivery. What arrived in the last shipment is everything. Extreme cold changes the relationship between body and food. It's not about hunger in the normal sense. It's thermodynamics. The human body maintains a core temperature of 37 degrees Celsius regardless of external conditions. In Antarctica, the outside air can be 90 or 100 degrees colder than your skin. Every breath, every exposed surface, every moment outdoors is a heat leak. The body compensates by burning fuel, fat, and carbohydrates to generate warmth. Inside the station, where temperatures are kept around 20 degrees, a person doing light work requires about 2,500 to 3,000 kilocalories per day, standard metabolic baseline. But step outside to repair a generator, string communications cable, or conduct field research and the demand spikes. 4,000 kilocalories, 5,000, 6,000 for extended outdoor work in the coldest months. Food stops being a choice. It becomes fuel you cannot afford to skip. Meals aren't leisure. They're mandatory refueling stops where the body replenishes what the cold has taken. The darkness compounds the challenge. The sun sets in late autumn and it doesn't rise for months. Perpetual night eliminates the body's ability to synthesize vitamin D through skin exposure to sunlight. Bone density, immune function, and mood all depend on adequate vitamin D. Without it, the body begins to break down in subtle, dangerous ways. The diet must compensate. Supplements help, but food sources, fatty fish, fortified dairy, egg yolks become essential, not optional. Every meal has to deliver not just calories, but specific nutrients that the environment has stolen. Antarctic food logistics rest on three interdependent systems, each designed to solve a different failure mode. The frozen stores form the backbone. Walk-in freezers, sometimes multiple rooms organized by category, meats, vegetables, dairy, bread, hold a staggering variety. Crates of beef steaks and roasts, whole chickens by the dozen, pork chops, bacon, lamb, bags of frozen peas, corn, broccoli, spinach, berries for baking, blocks of butter and cheese, ice cream. It resembles the frozen section of a supermarket, scaled up to feed 50 people for nine months. Some inland stations don't rely on mechanical freezers alone. They carve storage chambers directly into the ice itself, using the continent as a natural deep freeze. 
but even these stations maintain powered freezer rooms for consistent temperature control. The exterior ice may be cold, but it fluctuates with wind and sun exposure in ways that can degrade food quality. The frozen pillar provides variety and nutrition, but it has a single point of failure, power, a generator malfunction, a fuel shortage, a fire in the electrical system. Any of these would turn the freezers into liabilities. Without electricity, tens of thousands of kilograms of food would spoil, even in Antarctica. The mechanical systems are themselves dependent on diesel fuel, which is also a finite resource. That's where the second pillar comes in. Dry and canned goods occupy separate storage areas, often entire rooms stacked floor to ceiling. 25 kilogram sacks of flour, all-purpose bread, whole wheat, sugar, rice, pasta in every shape, oats, barley, lentils, dried beans, canned tomatoes, corn, beans, and fruit, tuna and salmon in cans, powdered milk and powdered eggs. These goods don't need refrigeration. They don't need power. If every freezer on the station failed, the crew could still eat. The menu would be monotonous. Pasta, rice, bread, canned vegetables. But survival would be possible. This redundancy is intentional. It's the fallback that prevents disaster. The third pillar is the most fragile and the most prized. Freshies, fresh produce, liquid milk, fresh eggs, arrive on the last resupply flight or vessel. Their lifespan is measured in days or weeks, not months. Hardier vegetables like potatoes, onions, carrots, and cabbage can last eight to 10 weeks if stored in cool, dark rooms. More delicate items, lettuce, tomatoes, berries, bananas, begin to decay almost immediately. They're consumed first, rationed by perishability rather than preference. The three pillars don't just provide food, they provide insurance against different types of failure, frozen for abundance, dry for survival, fresh for morale and vitamins that the body can't produce in the dark. The consumption of freshies follows a predictable, ritualized arc. In the first days after resupply, the galley serves fresh salads, sliced tomatoes, and fruit bowls. The station feels briefly like a normal place, but everyone knows the clock is running. Berries go first, then tomatoes, then peppers and cucumbers. Within two weeks, leafy greens have wilted or browned beyond use. Bananas blacken. The crew eats them anyway, baked into bread or blended into smoothies, extracting every last bit of nutrition and flavor. By the end of the first month, only the hearty vegetables remain potatoes, onions, carrots, cabbage. These are carefully monitored, checked for rot, and stored in the coolest rooms the station can provide without freezing them. They'll last another month, maybe two if conditions are ideal, and then they're gone. The last fresh salad is often announced days in advance. Crew members gather in the galley for a communal meal centered around the final bowl of greens. Photographs are taken. The salad is consumed slowly, deliberately, it's not dramatization, it's an acknowledgement of a threshold being crossed. The same ritual repeats for the last apple, the last orange, the last onion. These items are photographed, sometimes signed by the crew, and shared as a memento of what's been lost. It's not mourning, exactly, it's marking time. In a place with no seasons, no weather changes, no external markers of progression, food becomes the calendar. After the last freshies are gone, the diet shifts entirely to frozen vegetables and powdered or canned substitutes. Meals are still nutritious. They're still varied, but something has changed. The station feels more isolated. The connection to the outside world, to farms, to sunshine, to growing things has been severed. Chapter five, the green machine. Modern Antarctic stations have found a way to push back against the void. Hydroponic facilities, often repurposed shipping containers or dedicated rooms within the station, use no soil. Plants grow in nutrient-rich water solutions, their roots suspended or supported by inert media. LED arrays provide light in precise wavelengths, red and blue spectrums optimized for photosynthesis. Temperature, humidity, and carbon dioxide levels are computer controlled. It's not gardening. It's environmental engineering. The same principles that keep astronauts alive on the International Space Station apply to the coldest desert on Earth. The crops are chosen for speed and yield. Lettuce grows fastest, harvest ready in four to six weeks. Kale, spinach, arugula, chard, herbs like basil, cilantro, mint, and parsley. More advanced systems grow cherry tomatoes, cucumbers, and peppers, though these take longer and require more energy. 
Eden ISS, a research greenhouse at Germany's Neumeyer Station 3, produced over 200 kilograms of fresh vegetables in its first year of operation. It's a testbed for future Mars missions, but the immediate benefit is terrestrial. The station's small winter crew had fresh salads, fresh herbs, and fresh tomatoes through the darkest months. McMurdo Station and Amundsen-Scott South Pole Station both maintain long-running hydroponic programs. The South Pole facility is particularly striking, a humid green room in the driest place on Earth, where outside the walls the air holds almost no moisture and temperatures hover near 100 below. The psychological impact exceeds the nutritional value. Crew members volunteer to work in the hydroponics room tending plants, harvesting leaves, and adjusting nutrient levels. The act of caring for something living, something green, provides relief from the sterile white and gray monotony of the ice, the smell of fresh basil, the texture of a living leaf, the sight of something growing. It's a connection to a world that feels impossibly distant. The chef occupies a unique position on an Antarctic station. They're not support staff in the traditional sense. They're the architect of morale. For 270 days, the chef must create varied, appealing meals from a fixed inventory. No substitutions, no supply runs, no ordering missing ingredients. If the powdered eggs run out, there are no more eggs. If the last bag of coffee is opened, that's the beginning of the end. The job requires encyclopedic knowledge of the pantry, creativity under severe constraint, and the ability to read the emotional state of the crew through their food requests. A sudden craving for comfort food, mashed potatoes, macaroni and cheese, meatloaf, can signal homesickness or stress. The chef responds, adjusting menus to provide not just nutrition, but care. Communal dining happens at set times, breakfast, lunch, dinner. In the perpetual darkness, these meals are the only reliable temporal structure. They anchor the crew to a rhythm when the sun offers none. Circadian systems depend on routine. Without it, sleep cycles drift, productivity declines, and psychological strain increases. The galley itself is the station's social heart. It's where daily briefings happen, where friendships form, where professional hierarchies temporarily dissolve. The lead scientist sits next to the diesel mechanic. The station manager eats alongside the janitor in an environment where everyone's survival depends on everyone else. The galley reinforces that equality. To prevent the chef from becoming a servant class, stations enforce gash duty or house mouse rotations. Every person on station, regardless of rank or specialty, must spend time washing dishes, mopping floors, wiping tables, and assisting with basic food prep. The PhD astrophysicist peels potatoes. The chief engineer scrubs pots. It's not symbolic. It's structural. Shared labor prevents resentment, reinforces community, and reminds everyone that survival here is collective, not hierarchical. June 21st, the winter solstice in the southern hemisphere. The sun has been gone for months. It will not return for months more. Statistically, this is the halfway point of the isolation. Psychologically, it's the low point. The midwinter dinner counters that trough with ritual. Preparations begin weeks in advance. The chef has reserved specific ingredients since summer, items not used for any other meal. Lobster tails, filet mignon, fine cheeses, wine, desserts made from the last reserves of cream and chocolate. The menu is multi-course and formal, designed to feel like something outside the normal rhythm of station life. Crew members dress in their best clothes or in elaborate costumes if the station culture leans that direction. The galley is decorated. Tables are set with care. There are speeches, toasts, and the exchange of handmade gifts. Small tokens crafted over the winter from scrap materials, personal gestures in a place where nothing can be purchased. The dinner is not about the food, though the food is excellent. It's about the milestone. It's a designed emotional peak, a communal acknowledgement that the worst is halfway over. The days, imperceptibly at first, will begin to lengthen. The sun will return. Resupply will come. The ritual is shared across every Antarctic station, regardless of nation. On the same night, crews at McMurdo, Amundsen-Scott, Concordia, Neumeyer, and dozens of other stations sit down to their own feasts. They are isolated from each other by hundreds of kilometers of ice, but they are united by the calendar and the tradition. It's a reminder that they are not alone in their isolation. Beyond the station's heated walls, food becomes purely functional. 
Field camps, temporary shelters erected for remote research, operate on a different set of constraints. Weight, fuel, and time all work against variety. Cooking is done on small portable stoves, which must also melt snow for every drop of drinking water. Melting snow is time intensive and burns through fuel quickly. Every meal is a logistical calculation. The core diet is freeze-dried packets, beef stroganoff, lasagna, chili, add boiling water, wait 10 minutes, and eat. The meals are calorically complete and lightweight, but they're also monotonous. Texture becomes sameness. After a week of freeze-dried food, taste memory starts to fade. Field teams supplement with high-energy snacks, chocolate, mixed nuts, dried fruit, salami, cheese, energy bars with four or 500 kilocalories each. These are eaten throughout the day, often without stopping work, providing a constant trickle of fuel to bodies burning calories at extreme rates. Logistics are simplified through standardization. A man food box contains 4,500 kilocalories of food, everything one person needs for one day. A two-person 10-day field trip requires 20 boxes. The system removes guesswork and ensures no one underestimates their needs. Emergency rations exist in every vehicle, every field hut, and every personal survival pack. Vacuum-sealed bars designed to remain edible for years, providing enough calories to survive until rescue. They are a last resort, rarely touched, but their presence is mandatory. In an environment this hostile, preparation for the worst case is not optional. The contrast between field and station is stark. At the station, there's a chef, a galley, hydroponics, and frozen lasagna that tastes like lasagna. In the field, there's a packet that says lasagna and a stove. Both keep you alive, but only one keeps you human. After midwinter, it's still four months until the first plane. The station continues on frozen stores, dry goods, and whatever the hydroponic systems produce. The inventory shrinks. Certain items run out. A particular spice, a favorite condiment, the last of the coffee. Each absence is felt, but the rhythm holds. Meals at set times, gash duty rotations, themed dinners when the chef can still manage them. The galley remains the center of social life, even as the menu becomes more repetitive. In September, the sun returns, first as a faint glow on the horizon, then as a sliver of light, then as a full disc rising above the ice. Its return is celebrated with the same communal intensity as midwinter, Though quieter, the light doesn't bring food, but it brings hope. By October, the sea ice begins to thin. Weather patterns stabilize enough for aircraft to attempt landings. The first plane to arrive since February carries mail, fresh fruit, vegetables, and news from the outside world. It also carries the next rotation of crew, arriving to relieve those who have endured the winter. The winter overs greet the newcomers, help unload supplies, and begin the process of transition. They've survived not just the cold, but the isolation, the darkness, and the relentless countdown of a finite pantry. Food sustained them, but the rituals around food, the communal meals, the gash duty, the midwinter feast, the tending of hydroponic greens, sustained something deeper. They turned a group of isolated individuals into a community capable of enduring the longest night at the bottom of the world. Antarctic food systems reveal something fundamental about human survival in extreme environments. The engineering is necessary. The three pillar supply chain, the backup systems, and the calculated redundancies. But engineering alone doesn't carry a crew through nine months of isolation. What makes the difference is the recognition that humans need more than calories and vitamins. They need rhythm. They need ritual. They need the small dignities of a well-prepared meal and the shared work of cleaning up afterward. They need something to look forward to when the weeks blur together in darkness. The same principles apply beyond Antarctica. Spacecraft, submarines, offshore platforms. Anywhere humans push into hostile environments, food becomes more than fuel. It becomes the infrastructure of community, the marker of time, the anchor of normalcy in places that offer none. The winter overs who photograph the last apple aren't being sentimental. They're acknowledging a truth that every isolated crew eventually learns, that survival is as much about what sustains the mind as what sustains the body. And sometimes those things are the same.